Good evening and welcome to SLU. Um, I'm Helen Avery and you're here with me tonight um, on Sunday for uh, Constellation Stories. Um, and it's a real astronomical event this evening. Um, in many ways, we've got a full moon. It's the full pink moon and it's called full pink moon in my neck of the woods anyway, New York State, because um, of the flocks, the pink flocks, the flower that is covering meadows right now. It's also known as the sprouting moon. Uh, we're also celebrating Beltane, that's the sort of um, Celtic festival today um, that marks roughly between spring equinox and the summer solstice. And it's kind of a time where the cattle were out in the fields and there were lots of rituals for fertility and a good summer. So that's been celebrated and indeed if you're in Europe you may have tomorrow off as it's May the 1st, May Day. And we've also got Vesak Day which is, um, and it's celebrated at different times, not always the same time around the world, but it is a celebration of Buddha. Um, Buddha was said to have been born on a full moon, became enlightened on a full moon and passed on, left his body um, on a full moon and it's uh, celebrated uh, today um, or uh, tomorrow roundabouts um, <laughs> again it depends but I know that uh, that many people are saying the official day is today and there is a really amazing festival that takes place in a sort of hidden valley um, uh, in the mountains at the top of the world I know we had a show on that before so um, I won't go on about it but a real a real beautiful evening to be looking up at the skies um, or even joining us uh, to look through some telescopes tonight. And the telescopes are all open, which is really amazing. So fantastic. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, as for the, the moon, the relevance right now to us is that it might blow out <laughs> some, some definition from through the telescopes this evening because it's a full moon. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but the other relevance of the full moon is tonight we are looking at a constellation named by the founder of moon mapping, uh, Johannes Hevelius. He was the one who uh, called Canis Venatici. That's the constellation we're looking at tonight. He was the one who named it, um, gave it like a formal title. It was just sort of a bunch of stars up until then. Um, and he also was, as I say, very well known for mapping the moon. And we're going to talk about him a bit later. But we're going to dive straight into Canis Venatici. Um, and I just wanted to check with you um, uh, how we're doing. If you're with us on the space situ in the space situation room, you can see that we've got all of these um, telescopes open. So I'm just going to quickly flick through them. The Canary All Sky, you can see the moon. Canary Wide Field, how are we doing? Right, here we are, Cor Caroli. That's our first uh, star for this evening. That's the alpha star of Canis Venatici. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. Um, I'm looking at the Canary Ultra Wide Field. There we are again. Uh, the Deep Sky. Uh, I don't think I've set that up right now. We've got the half meter, um, mm -mm -mm, which isn't set up right now. So um, basically, we're on uh, the wide field and ultra wide field for the duration. Uh, then, when it comes to galaxies, I've put us into the Deep Sky and the half meter. Uh, the timing is a bit off. If you're getting confused at all, if um, in the on the community board, on the latest post from me on the thread, it will have the rundown of all the things we're going to look at tonight. We have got a lot uh, on um, to look through the telescope. Such a tiny constellation, Canis Venatici, um, but um, just like jam-packed with objects so I didn't want to kind of load us up too much at the beginning but as um, we progress over this hour we're going to be getting through a lot of galaxies and I might not be able to keep up because we've got a lot to talk about but the list is there for you um, should you get lost and fortunately most of the th objects we're looking at don't just go by their catalogue names and numbers which can get confusing where they actually have their like proper names so like the whale galaxy um, what else we've got? We've got the Cat's Eye Galaxy, the Cocoon Galaxy, Sunflower Galaxy, Whale Galaxy is coming up in a bit. So uh, hockey stick. So um, hopefully you'll be able to sort of find your way around and maybe you'll listen and you'll zone, tune me out <laughs> and just um, click through the telescopes and enjoy and take pictures. And if you're um, tuning into YouTube later, I've got some 
um, images that I'll throw up as well on the main show page. Um, so uh, we'll get along now with that. Right, here we go. So I think we're just uh, catching the end of Corcaroli, um, which is to say the alpha star uh, in um, Canon Svenatici. Uh, and we'll be moving on uh, in T2 to La Superba, um, which uh, if you're looking on the main page, um, you'll see just, you know, roughly where we are. I just kind of wanted to help us out to know where, where is Canon Svenatici. Um, and it's kind of under Ursa Major, which you can't really quite see here, but it's above Coma Berenices and it's near Boates. Um, and it's said to be these two dogs that you'll see in this picture underneath, and they are greyhounds. And Canis Benetici is Latin for hunting dogs. Um, but it was like a type of greyhound in particular that was used for hunting. Um, if you're on the main page, you can see Corcaroli here as well. It's a binary star. Um, and then underneath, you'll see a little image, and it just shows you the two main stars, the Alpha and Beta, are Corcaroli and Chara, which means joy. Um, and then if you come up from there, you'll see a little Y. <laughs> that is La Superba. Um, so La Superba, I've put in here, because it's kind of interesting, it's like largely unsung, and it's a red carbon star. Um, uh, not as uh, red as um, our Leporis, but um, it's kind of an interesting star. Carbon stars have this molecular, um, they have a molecular, molecular absorption of cyanogen um, and other features that kind of wipe out the blue parts of their spectra. So it kind of leaves them as glowing coals. So I don't know if you're able to, to see that right now, um, looking through T2. Um, but I thought uh, I thought it'd be cool to have up there. Um, but Corcaroli is really what sort of catches people's imagination with this very, very small constellation. Um, and it means the heart of Charles. And there's a really, really lovely story around it. Um, so, uh, and it's kind of where we're going to begin this evening. And we don't know whether it refers to King Charles I or King Charles II. Um, but given it's a binary star, I think we can kind of get away with saying it's the two of them. Um, and um, the, the tales of Charles I and Charles II are too long for us to get into. But um, I thought, you know, I kind of share some of it with you. So they lived in the 1600s at the time of Johannes Helvilius. And they were kings of England at the time when Oliver Cromwell uh, decided to do away with the monarchy and have Parliament run Britain. And Charles I was executed by Oliver Cromwell in 1649. He was beheaded. Uh, pretty gruesome. And Charles II, his son, had been sort of exiled with, um, with his mother. And then he came back when he was a bit older and fought Cromwell and lost in a very famous battle called the Battle of Worcester. Then he went, um, sort of ended up kind of... Uh, uh, going into exile again and then he returned to England when Cromwell died and then became king again it was called the restoration but Charles II was a real character he really loved drinking and merriment indeed he was known as the merry monarch um, but a real party goer um, and apparently confessed to at least 12 illegitimate children and um, and while he was on the run in England when he lost the battle of Worcester it said that he was like to have hidden inside an oak tree for a day um, and drunk beer to get him through uh, while he was in this tree and actually you can go and see this tree I believe in England this very old tree um, and then he disguised himself as a manservant and then he hid on a ship pretending to be a bankrupt merchant and then traveled around Europe sort of parading as all sorts of things including a beggar because at times he had no money so he had these real juicy stories and and then it was um uh he say so when Oliver Cromwell died, he was brought back, and there was all this festivity because people loved him. He was such a jolly, <laughs> jolly king, and they'd gone through this horrible period with Oliver Cromwell. Um, so he comes back, and uh, and he actually f is the founder of the Royal Society. So that's where you know um, all the famous astronomers of the day were asked to join, inclu including Hevelius. Um, so a real connection there but it's said that the doctor for Charles II a gentleman called Charles Scarborough got to name the star uh, and he wanted to call it the heart of Charles and he um, is re reported to have saying that the, the this Corcaroli shone 
really brightly on the night of 1660, May 29, when Charles II returned to London to the restoration of the monarchy. So it seems like he might have been named after, the star might be named after Charles II, although, you know, the gentleman who named it was called Charles himself. So <laughs> who knows if he just said that because he wanted a star named after himself. Um, we don't know. Uh, but it's kind of a stormy heart, actually, because if, um, if you're looking on the main page, um, one of the stars, the binary stars, is, is a good bit bigger and heavier than the sun, actually, and dozens of times brighter. And the other one also is bigger than the sun, um, although not as impressive as that larger star. But um, there are storms on the uh, larger star. And it stirs up a lot of layers of gas, um, sort of giving Charles kind of a stormy heart. So a really lovely star. And it's only third magnitude, so it's not always the easiest to see. Um, Johannes Hevelius was said to have like this amazing eyesight that he could see to the seventh magnitude. Um, it was said that was why he was such an amazing astronomer. So for him, this would have been a walk in the park, looking up and seeing this constellation. Uh, but for us, it might be a bit more difficult. You're going to need a, a bit of a clearer sky. Um, and indeed, like because it wasn't, it's not such a bright um, coupling of stars, or actually there's more than more than two stars. Um, um, Ptolemy actually never even gave it a name. It was just sort of these unfigured stars below the constellation Ursa Major in the um, uh, Amalgest, um, rather than like a distinct constellation. Um but uh, nonetheless, it's there, and actually, Corcaroli is part of the Virgo diamond. We've talked about that before, and that's made up of the stars Spica, Arcturus in Boetes that you can see here, uh, Spica in Virgo, um, which is not far away, um, and then De Nebula in Leo, and, and then Corcaroli makes up the, the final corner of this diamond. So a really really um kind of sweet star if you can locate it in the sky with a super sweet story <laughs> um uh, nothing to do with hunting dogs <laughs> but um but certainly um yeah not a myth per se and in fact this constellation doesn't really have much in the way of myth going for it um but uh, but nonetheless we've got some stories to share this evening so i'm just gonna hop back over to uh ba -ba -ba the um, uh, s uh, space situation room because I want to just run through the telescopes and see what we've got. We should have the whale galaxy and indeed I can see it is there. Uh, and this is on every telescope um, that I've got here. Uh, oh, I know why. The half meter isn't coming on till 9.15. You can only book uh, on the fives. Um, so that's coming up at 9.15. But um, uh, we are looking, as I say, at the Whale Galaxy. Um, and I got really excited about this this week. I didn't know it was called the Whale Galaxy. Um, I knew it by its um, co like mm, catalogue number. Um, but uh, it is, as the members informed me, it's the Whale Galaxy. And there's a galaxy just above it uh, that you'll see, and that's known as the Pup. So together they're known as the whale and the pup, the cosmic whale and pup galaxies. And um, this is an edge-on galaxy. So it's a spiral galaxy, the whale galaxy, but we're looking at it from the edge on. That's why it has this sort of elongated figure. It's also sometimes called the herring galaxy because it looks like a, a herring, I suppose. <laughs> um, but it really captures the imagination because, I don't know about you, but I consider like the big, the ocean similar to... Um, the cosmos sort of this unexplored region that we're not like very familiar with that is very vast um, and we forget you know we wander around on land all the time and uh, we forget that there's this whole universe out there and we also forget that there's this whole um, there's all this life happening on the majority of the planet in water and I've talked about this before but I'm kind of obsessed with blue planet 2 um, which I believe you can see on BBC America right now. I'm not sure. Um, I have the DVD, but it, it's uh, it's like a documentary that has this amazing photography, um, videography that takes you underneath the ocean um, and really brings to life the life that is in in the ocean and makes you realise just how vast our planet is. In the same way that when I look up at night, I feel like how how incredibly vast the universe is, and both of them have this effect of very being very humbling and um sort of realizing that we're just kind of like 
we don't know so much and we're, we're so unimportant really in the grand scheme of life that's just happening without, you know, life doesn't care our opinions on um, politics or uh, family life or <laughs> what our neighbours doing with their front yard. Like it just, uh, we forget that um, so much is happening and we're, we're just such a tiny, tiny speck of all of it. So I really loved this being the whale galaxy and this uh, the sort of feeling of this huge cosmic whale just like gliding, um, gliding through space. So I had a couple of uh, images that I wanted to put up. Um, here we go. What's going on here? Mm, there we go. Uh, and it was just that this week there's um, a video doing the rounds of a whale. Uh, it was on ABC News actually. And then I, I saw it and then I looked at this um, picture. This is a NASA picture of the whale galaxy, which is why it's slightly different to what we're seeing with our SLU telescopes and <laughs> um, more color. But you can see um, they're very similar. It looks like this whale just like swimming through the vast ocean of space so really beautiful um it's about 25 million light years away so it's not that far really relatively speaking um and um um it's kind of similar in size to our own milky way uh, and let's say it has this companion galaxy it's an elliptical gal gal galaxy which we we know as the pup um and there's a lot of uh well i say a lot i can't even put it into words but a lot of star formation and star birth happening as you can see and um, if you're looking at the image um on the uh like the main page that i've put up from nasa you'll see that all the blue um all that star formation that's happening uh, and then i read this beautiful thing um today and it said just as blue whales the biggest creatures on earth can gorge themselves on comparatively tiny bits of plankton so the whale galaxy has become filled with gas and dust that powers a high rate of star formation. So I just love that, just to look at this galaxy and think of all those little stars being formed as like cosmic plankton. <laughs> so just beautiful. So I'm just going to take a pause there and say, and just sort of look through these um, different images that are coming up uh, in the telescopes. Um, so we can just sort of muse on this wonderful whale galaxy. So you can see now in the half meter, uh, which is like a black and white image, um, it really does look just like a, a whale with this, with its pup. Um, but that is an edge on galaxy, say the similar size to our own. So just, uh, just beautiful. Um, there's so many treats in this. A tiny constellation it reminds me of Coma Berenices do you remember when we we looked at that like some of us haven't even heard of it but it was just like just so bountiful um in terms of the number of galaxies uh, now I mentioned that this is kind of lacking on myth but not entirely and we'll talk a little bit about it because the hunting dogs as I mentioned are associated with Boates um and we will look at Boates um it's not I don't think it's going to be visible in the telescopes at this time for another couple of weeks. Um, uh, it certainly wasn't this week because I was going to think I was thinking about doing the two together. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about the myth of Boaties, but there's a lot of myth, uh, so we'll have plenty of that. Although interestingly, it's not heavy on objects. So here we have uh, Boaties dogs, heavy on objects, not much on myth. But who? So who are these dogs? Um, while we're we're sat here looking at the whale galaxy um so uh i say they belong to boates um that's sort of generally how the myth has gone they belong to boates and boates means bear watcher so it was thought that or is sort of said um and hevelius kind of backed this up by calling these the two hunting dogs really he obviously believed they belonged to Boates these were the hunting dogs of Boates who was hunting the bear the great bear Ursa Major and it's part of this story that we talked about last time um, for Ursa Major um, of Callisto if you remember being the mother of Arcturus and she was turned into a bear uh, and Arcturus went to was out hunting one day and was about to kill this bear and then Zeus stopped in uh, stepped in because he didn't want to see Arcturus kill his mother 
Um, and then they all got put in the sky. If you, I don't know if you remember that story we talked about. But it's said that maybe Arctur, um, Boatides is Arcturus on this hunt. Um, so this is kind of with his hunting dogs uh, facing Ursa Urs Major before um, they get turned into, uh, before he's about to sort of kill uh, kill this bear that is actually his mother, Callisto. So that's one story that these two dogs belong to him. Now, some other people say, well, actually, those dogs belong, uh, the dogs aren't Canis Fenatici, they're Canis Major and Canis Minor. Um, I don't subscribe to that theory. Uh, there is a, a different story um, that kind of ties in a bit more with our beer drinking Mary Charles uh, that I want to share with you. Um, but before we do, I just wanted to bring your attention to the object that we're looking at right now. Um, that's through T2. I uh, didn't book it through the other telescopes. It is a globular cluster. And I get so excited when we get to look at globular clusters. I think I prefer them even to galaxies. Um, I don't know why I just get I just think they're so beautiful <laughs> so this is m3 and it doesn't have an interesting name at all um, which I think is a shame because so many of the globular clusters have really pretty names um, uh, like the beehive for example uh, and there's also one in Boates I can't remember the name now but it has a it has a kind of a pretty name so I feel like maybe it's a challenge for slew members to to um, uh, name this very beautiful cluster and um, I'm just going to put a picture of the cluster up on the main page for those looking later there you go uh, so you can really see M3 in all its glory um, but uh, I'm enjoying looking at it through the through the wide field right now and I'm just looking through the ultra wide field for a bit more of a expanded view um, so uh, it's about 32,000 light years from Earth. Not far at all. Uh, not far at all. Um, and it is bright enough to be seen with binoculars. So if you've got a clear night tonight, pop out and see it. It's good to see um, April, May time. And apparently it can even be seen with a naked eye. It was just, it was apparently the first Messier object to be discovered by Charles Messier himself and was discovered not. Uh, too long um, uh, sort of around this day it was discovered on May the 3rd but in 1764 and this is one of the largest and brightest globular clusters in our night sky and is sort of thought to be made of around half a million stars although I've also seen numbers that say a million so I don't know uh, and then also I've seen estimates that this is 8 billion years old this cluster it is, um, there are about 250 or so known globular clusters in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and this one is particularly well known because it has many variable stars within it. So well worth um, getting out the binoculars and having a look at this lovely cluster and maybe coming up with a name for it. Um, but back to this uh, alternative story um, with the dogs. So there's one Greek legend that identifies Boates as Icarius, um, just like kind of a, a gentleman farmer, like just a farmer or a shepherd kind of guy. Um, and he's one day visited by Dionysius, the Greek god of wine, uh, the Roman god Bacchus, um, uh, who kindly teaches him how to make the wa make wine of the gods. I mean, what a gift! just wonderful um and Icarius is a really kind generous gentleman and so he decides to share this wine of the gods you know that tastes like divine nectar um and he gives a bottle to some local shepherds who have a glorious night of partying and merriment together um in a similar fashion to King Charles II. <laughs> um, but then the shepherds go to sleep and they wake up the next day. And uh, maybe you've been there. But um, never having drunk before, the shepherds don't really understand why they feel like death. <laughs> uh, apparently the wine of the gods isn't good enough to not create a hangover. Um, and they assume that Icarius must have tried to poison them. 
because uh, <laughs> they just don't, they don't realize what they're feeling is the hangover. So off they trot to Icarus's home and they drag him out into a field and they murder him and bury his body in a shallow grave. So a little, you know, if you're sort of thinking of parallels so you can remember some of these tales together around this constellation, you know, maybe like the execution of Charles I, poor Icarus is also executed, but not by Oliver Cromwell, but by some hungover shepherds. So um, when Icarius' daughter, Erigone, returns home, she is um, Virgo in this story, uh, and finds her father missing, she takes the two dogs and goes off searching for him, um, but in sort of a tragedy befitting the Greeks. Poor Erigone and the dogs find the grave of Icarius, and in her despair, Erigone then hangs herself from a nearby tree. It's never going to be a happy ending with a Greek story. Um, and, th- and then it gets worse because the loyal dogs, now without any owners, stay guard over the bodies until they too die of starvation. Uh, and horrified by this tragic tale, Zeus, or some say Dionysius, because he probably felt pretty bad, put the four in the heavens as an apology. So Icarius is memorialised in Boetes, the two dogs, uh, the constellation Canis Venetici, and Erigone is um, close by in Virgo. So one thing I didn't mention about the two dogs, um, uh, what Johann Hevelius um, made this constellation Corcoroli and Chara that we saw. Uh, it's called the the um, I think they're the Southern Dog, uh, and then um, there is a Northern Dog. Uh, which actually doesn't really have any stars that we like have a name per se and um, they're more like sort of kind of an asterism and they're called asterion which means starry um sorry so they're the northern dog uh, and then the southern dog is made up of corcoroli and chara um uh, and sometimes when you see depictions of the dogs in sort of old drawings they'll have around the neck a collar and the collar one collar will say asterion uh, and the other collar um uh will say uh, chara uh meaning joy so there is joy and merriment um although the greeks obviously came along kibosh the joy and merriment to some extent <laughs> with their tragic tale um so that is an alternative but i say there are so many uh, stories about Boetes, but we'll talk about those when we come to that constellation but i wanted to share that so you can sort of get an idea of who the dogs are um in fact let's just bring that picture of the dogs back up on the main page so you can see there's Boetes, um and there are the dogs and i'm sure if we zoomed in we'd be able to read on their collar and corcoroli you can see is the southern dog um and if you sort of actually let's just see if i can just zoom this in i might regret this there you go um corcoroli you can just see on this picture um i've zoomed in very badly um <laughs> that uh, there's like a crown and a heart um on the collar of the southern dog chara um, and that star of course is cor Corcoroli, Charles's heart. It's sometimes depicted as a heart um, with a crown on it, sort of made into a bit of an asterism, but it's you know, a bit sort of fudged, really. So here we are, maybe some inspiration within those stories of what to call uh, this beautiful globular cluster that we're looking at right now. Um, I don't know, maybe something to do with being bleary eyed and hungover, <laughs> or, or maybe something to do with uh, being merry and jolly <laughs> um great so i'm just going to take a look at what we've got coming up next um as things start to pick up a little bit yes that's right we're going to be looking at the whirlpool which uh should be already on the half meter yes um if you're looking at number five uh, and the telescopes um under the main page you'll see the whirlpool galaxy um and it's very nearby other galaxy that it's interacting with. So, um, and then we'll have the whirlpool on T2 and T3 uh, for, it might be on T3 already actually. Yeah, it is um, on the Canary Deep Sky number four. Uh, and then it comes on T2 at uh, on half past the hour.
So we can really see it in sort of lots of different uh, perspectives. Um, it's the most famous, really, of the galaxies within Canis Venatici, uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy is M51, and it's got a really lovely story of its own. Um, and I wanted to share with you, there's um, actually a group, uh, you know, I mentioned Canis Venatici has a lot of galaxies. We're going to see some tonight, but there are a whole lot more. Um, and it has something called the M51 group, and it's named after this particular galaxy. And within the M51 group, which are gravitationally bound galaxies, there are about, um, about seven, I think, galaxies in that. And the sunflower, which is coming up next, is also within um, that group, the M51 group. Um, the Milky Way, by the way, if you don't know, is... Um, also part of a group of gravitationally bound galaxies and that's called the local group it's actually about 54 galaxies that are kind of um, bound together but this is the whirlpool um, and i recommend if you're looking through the telescopes to carry on looking at it but for those who are watching post uh in um uh on youtube i'm just going to pull up some pictures for you so you um can uh, see roughly what we're seeing well, actually, you're seeing a picture from NASA, so it's not what we're seeing, but it's pretty amazing. So, um, and here we go. Let's see. Uh, yeah, tons of images up there um, right now because I'm going to talk, uh, and I'll talk through them about the story about the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, but certainly recommend you stay looking at it through the telescopes and get a good picture if you can. I'm really enjoying the half meter. Uh, image and I'm gonna click a picture right now <laughs> um, yeah wow it's phenomenal so the Whirlpool Galaxy um, you can sort of find it at the end of um, uh, not far from the Dipper's handle of uh, the Big Dipper's handle um, it's about 25 million light years away although again the distance as I've read varies um, nearly a thousand times further away than the globular cluster we just saw um, and you can see that that is a satellite galaxy it's um, NGC 5195 um, and it's kind of disrupting M51 the Whirlpool galaxy which is perhaps why we're um, um, sort of likely responsible for the beautiful spiral structure of the Whirlpool Galaxy and this sort of high star formation rate within that. Uh, at the centre of this galaxy is a modest, <laughs> supermassive black hole, similar to the one at the centre of the Milky Way. Um, and as I say, this is gravitationally bound to um, uh, several other galaxies, including the Sunflower Galaxy that we'll look at in a moment. Um, but the story of the Whirlpool is 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 really sweet. So. Um, it was um, seen by a gentleman, sort of discovered, I say, the spiral nature of it by a gentleman called William Parsons, who was also known as the third Earl of Ross, uh, as, a, as sort of an Irish um, uh, Earl. Um, and it, it was sort of a, he has a sort of a bizarre history himself. He sort of came from this family and from this town that sounds like Dishwater, Leicestershire. Um, <laughs> and they kind of moved to Ireland and made themselves earls. And he's the third earl. Um, and he really loved astronomy. And he was known for cons building this enormous telescope on his Irish castle um, in the 1840s. And I've, so I've put a picture of that telescope on the main page and you can see it kind of inserted into the castle. And it was called Leviathan, um, which seems very fitting, as it was the largest telescope in the world until 1918. And with it, Lord Ross, or Earl Ross, the third Earl, um, he was able to sort of see these giant swirls of the near universe kind of and he turned them into these drawings um, he, and because he noticed this repetition of spirals you know and then we as we know we think about sacred geometry for example but spirals are everywhere in nature nature just seems to love them um, and so he drew them and you'll see uh, on the 
um, the show page, I've put this image up of what he drew. And it said that that drawing um, of the Whirlpool Galaxy inspired Van Gogh's Starry Nights. That that swirl you can see in Van Gogh's Starry Nights right there is supposedly um, the Whirlpool Galaxy. I find this really hard to believe. I just it's just baffling to me that that would be the case. Um, but I also just love it to think that. Uh, we look up to Kenneth Venetici, um, uh, knowing that the Whirlpool Galaxy is in there, and it uh, its imagery inspired potentially one of the most famous paintings in the world, is <laughs> Van Gogh's Starry Nights. And if you were with us last time when we talked about Ursa Major, uh, I believe the painting is called Starry Nights Along the Rhone, or Starry Nights Above the Rhone. Um, is another Van Gogh painting. It actually has the Big Dipper in it. So obviously Van Gogh was familiar with astronomy. They, I mean, they're all polymaths, aren't they? These, these old uh, painters. They're all philosophers and mathematicians and astronomers at the same time. I don't know how they got to be so talented. <laughs> um, whereas today we're also sort of specialists. But back in the day, they're all polymaths. But he obviously knew um, and was intrigued by astronomy. Um, uh, because I say he had the Big Dipper, he had Ursa Major within this other painting, and here supposedly is the Whirlpool Galaxy um, in Starry Nights. So I just love it, and I also just love this picture uh, of Leviathan, like embedded in this Irish castle, um, uh, and then these sort of more detailed pictures of the Whirlpool Galaxy, and you can see it interacting with this other galaxy. Um, uh, and just flicking back to the telescopes. On our main page, do you have a look there? So we may have been moved on to the Sunflower Galaxy. Um, so the Sun, yeah. So T three, uh, yeah. We should all be on the Sunflower Galaxy now. Every telescope is on the Sunflower Galaxy. Um, so kind of interesting, don't you think? That uh, let me just get rid of these images and put some up. That the Sunflower Galaxy, well, Van Gogh is also famous for his picture of, his, what's his painting called? The sunflowers. Um, so a real sort of Van Gogh theme up in this area of the sky, um, with Ursa Major just there, and um, Canis Venetici below it. So I've just put um, a couple of images up on the main page, one of Van Gogh's picture of sunflowers, and then a NASA image of the Sunflower Galaxy. And um, it was apparently so named the sunflower galaxy because of its beautiful sort of spiral structure reminded um, people of the head of a sunflower so again this whole sort of um, exploration of nature replicating similar patterns and in this case spirals um, whether it's up in the vastness of space or down in sort of the macro um, the micro uh, cosm of a, a sunflower head so just kind of really amazing and maybe we'll do something on uh, um, sacred geometry at some point but a couple of things about the sunflower galaxy a couple of facts um, it was discovered in 1779 by a French astronomer Pierre Machen um, we're actually going to see the Machen galaxy later although I'm not going to talk about it it's just going to be on T1 at uh, 9.45 um, and uh, the sunflower galaxy is about 27 million light years from Earth, as you would imagine, because it's part of the gravitational um, moving galaxy set, M51 group. Um, and the Whirlpool galaxy was a similar distance. So um, it was the um, first, did I just say this, the first of 24 objects that Michel contributed to Charles Messier's catalogue. Oh, I don't know if we did. Um, but it has apparent magnitude of 9.3 and appears as a really faint patch of light in small telescopes. So it's nice that we're getting a bit of a uh, more close-up view with Slew's telescopes. Um, again, the best time to look at it is May. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, I'm just going to pause there so we can just sort of finally catch up with it. It almost like, has like a yellowy hue as well. Um, which uh, I love. Um, so I'm just flicking through the telescopes myself just to, to get a look of it. Wow. And in the half meter, it looks 
totally amazing. Uh, I don't often use Canary One, so it's um, I'm excited to to be able to use it this evening. Because uh, sometimes, you know, I don't know if you remember in winter, um, it really doesn't do well with any slight wind. Um, but you know, as we move into spring and summer, we can start using it a lot more. So I'm really enjoying that. Um, so we're moving on now. Let's say we're going to be moving through them fast. Um, but I have a lot more I wanted to talk to you about about Hevelius. So I'll kind of see what we can get through, and we'll sort of try and guide you through some of the things we're looking at. Um, but coming up is M94. It's a compact spiral, also called the Cat's Eye um, Galaxy. Um, not to be confused with the Cat's Eye Nebula. It's something entirely different. Uh, but we'll have that followed by the cocoon, then the hockey stick, uh, and then NGC 4449. So some more irregular galaxies, the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. Um, if you're into that, I know some of you are. Um, we're going to be looking at some of those guys uh, towards the end. Um, uh, and then as I point out, if you want to stay on the half meter, the when Sunflower ends at 9.45, the Mishen Galaxy is going to be, um, that's M106, um, will be uh, there just because, uh, you know, we had a gap and I just thought, well, we'll try and I'll put it in for you. But I wanted to chat about um, Johannes Sevelius uh, and really kind of sort of celebrate him. Um, you know, as we don't have a lot of myth to share, I always think it's nice to sort of share about the people who, um, and the lives of the people who, who discovered uh, these objects that we're looking at, because, you know, those stories are often just as rich um, as the myths. So I'm just trying to gather my notes together. Where is he? Okay. Right. So I'm just going to put up a couple of images of him. Uh, oh, spoiler. Um, there he is. There he is. Mm, there he is. Okay. So if you're looking on the main page, that is a picture of Johann Hevelius. Um, this is his moon map, and uh, this is also a telescope. So, um, yeah, to share about him, he was born in Poland in 1611 in Gdansk. Um, uh, to a couple who were uh, German-speaking Lutherans um, and were wealthy brewing merchants of Bohemian origin. They brewed beer and they made famous beer. I think it's called Joppa beer. It's, um, and there's even a Joppa Strasse um, named after them. So we seem to be on this sort of booze theme for this constellation. So maybe that's easy to remember. We've got the um, Icaria story of the uh, making the wine that gave shepherds hangover we've got charles ii who drank beer hiding in a tree um, and now we've got the the founder of uh, canis venetici johann johannes hevelius who came from a family of beer brewers but he spent his adolescence under the tutelage of um the famed german astronomer mathematician and polymath he was one of those guys peter kruger um there's actually a crater on the moon named after peter kruger uh, and so he kind of became interested in astronomy, um, but he also studied law. Um, again, a polymath himself, Hevelius, and he travelled around England and France um, and Switzerland, and he met Pierre Gassendi um, and several other astronomers that really kind of sparked his interest even more in astronomy. So in 1634, he comes back to Gdansk and he gets married uh, to a neighbour who um, is two years younger and who owns two adjacent houses. So now he has this row of three houses and what he does is he builds an observatory on the roof of all three houses and he calls it Star Castle. Like, how beautiful is that? <laughs> so here he is, Johannes Sevelius, um, with his wonderful Star Castle in Gdansk. Um, uh, but he's not just an astronomer. Several things uh, say he's like a polymath. So he, he's a lawyer, but he also becomes a member of the Beer Brewing Guild, uh, which he leads, actually, from 1943 onwards. Um, so he keeps this connection to beer. Uh, so maybe if you're out there tonight looking up at the stars and the moon, you might want to crack open a beer and cheers to, to Johannes Sevelius. 
Um, and he also becomes a town councillor. Um, but to say chiefly, his interest is astronomy. Uh, that's really what he's known for. Uh, so I just wanted to take a breath in this story um, while mentioning the uh, sort of moving on to the cocoon galaxy in a moment. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, you can see that. Uh, I'm looking at it through T2. Um, so I just, uh, it's, this is an interesting galaxy, so I just kind of wanted to sort of mention this uh, in among my notes. So these are interacting galaxies, you can kind of see them there. Um, and uh, even like a small backyard telescope, you'll be able to see the, these galaxies. So um, over millions of years, the attraction between these two galaxies um, has kind of dragged them closer together. So eventually they collided actually in this like uh, like a crush of stars and gas and dust. Um, but that really intense period is over. Um, and uh, the, those two galaxies have kind of moved through their collision um, and untangled themselves and are kind of speeding apart again. But gravity, you can't beat it. You can't fight against it. So they're likely to collide again, but it won't be for a few billion years. But because of that collision, they're kind of a sort of really unusual shape now. Um, so uh, um, you can see like the, the sort of elongated one that was once a sort of bar, it was a barred spiral, um, sort of similar to the Milky Way, but now it's sort of been stretched out and that's why it's called the cocoon galaxy. It looks like, a well, use your imagination but maybe it looks like a cocoon um and um uh and then there we have the other galaxy um just above it uh which has a sort of does still have like its spiral arms um so it has some hints of its spiral structure so that's the cocoon galaxy um just kind of an interesting one. As I say, the next few we're going to get through are all these like peculiar galaxies. It's kind of interesting to see compared to, you know, the, the shapes we see often, like the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, so back to Hevelius. Um, so he has all these different talents. He's a beer brewer and he's like the counsellor of the town and he's a lawyer. But he really is interested in astronomy. As I say, he has this star castle on top of the roofs. And he gets visited by several Polish kings and queens over the years. And indeed, later in his life, he's let off paying taxes because he's so well respected. <laughs> um, uh, he also becomes the first Pole to become a member of the Royal Society. So I mentioned before that he was asked to become a member and he did. So he was really known um, for his instruments. As I said, he had like really exceptional keen eyesight and. Um, and a real fascination with um, instruments versus telescopes. Um, and uh, his sort of fascination with using different instruments um, was so much that uh, Halley actually um, was instructed by Robert Hooke and John Flamseed to go, he, he was instructed to go over to Gdansk and persuade Hevelius to start using telescopes instead for his measurements because he had very highly respected work but it was disapproved that he wasn't using telescopes because telescopes have been around now for you know 40, 50 years um, and he should be using them. But um, it turned out that Hevelius sort of demonstrated to Halley that he could really just do well with only a quadrant and something called an alidade. Um, uh, so sort of Halley was like, okay, you know, that's fine. Um, it seems like <laughs> you're accurate enough. Um, and so it was sort, of, sort of interesting. It was seen that, you know, Hevelius was considered like the last astronomer to do major work without the use of a telescope. So a real interesting guy, but he did use a telescope um, uh, um, because he ended up building a 150 foot refracting telescope on the shores of the Baltic Sea. Um, and I just put an image of that up. If you're looking at the main page, you'll see this enormous, enormous and what looks to be very unstable telescope that he built. Um, so it was like encased in a heavy iron tube 
Um, and he arranged the lenses in like a wooden trough and suspended the whole thing from this 90 foot pole and used like ropes and pulleys and and a team of people to operate it Um, and it would shake in the smallest of breeze so you can imagine sometimes what we face with T1 in a breeze and that's a really sturdy telescope Um, and here he is with this kind of wobbly um, probably 150 foot refractor Uh, so it sort of made it difficult to line up the lenses for observations, so it it was rarely, rarely used. But um, uh, he kind of, as I say, tended to stick with his um, instruments. Um, and he discovered ten constellations, which we have seven that are recognised today. Obviously, Canis Venatici being one, uh, and. Um, he uh, one of his constellations is sextons um and he named it that because there was a fire in his observatory in 1679 and his observatory was destroyed his instruments were destroyed and his books were destroyed um uh and he was sort of a bit devastated by it um and so he called this constellation sextons in memory of these lost instruments um And he also has a triangulum, I think, uh, although we don't use that now, um, but I think he named that one as well. But he did repair it, he repaired the damage um, and was able to observe the Great Comet of December 1680. He actually discovered several comets as well. Um, But he is most well known for his work on the moon. But before we talk about that, I just wanted to step back to the telescopes because we are now looking at the hockey stick. So another unusual or peculiar galaxy. Um, The hockey stick, I've seen it called the hummingbird as well. Um, And uh, let's see. Um... Oh, yeah, that was it. I also saw it called the crowbar, which kind of made me laugh. <laughs> Just slightly different. Someone, you always think of crowbars as being used to break into cars. So um, a bit different to a hockey stick. Uh, so this shape is thought to be due to an interaction between um, this particular galaxy and a couple of other neighbours, um, the whale galaxy being one of those neighbours, and its pup. Um, and it's actually got two names um, because it's seen that sort of that bright part in the middle. Uh, there's also another bright part slightly up the top. Uh, so it had it's got sort of two new general catalog names, although really it's just one. It's just one object, um, uh, the hockey stick galaxy. Um, and Stephen James O'Meara, who you know, listening to me, who I just love his books. Um, he uh, jokes and calls this um, the Messier hockey stick galaxy, not after Charles Messier, but after the ice hockey player, Mark Messier, who apparently played for the New York Rangers and uh, helped them win one year in ni- 1994, I think. So he, he calls it the Messier hockey stick, which I, that's kind of fun. Um, so I just wanted to bring your uh, attention to that. Uh, and in fact, looking through the ultra wide field um, is where you can see, uh, if you're looking on the, it's like the number three, uh, you can see the whale galaxy up on the right hand side and the pup uh, slightly above it. So that's what's causing the hockey stick shape of this particular galaxy. So I'm really glad we get to see um, the nearness of the whale galaxy there to the hockey stick. Uh, and you can see that also in deep sky. And I don't think I put it in the half meter. No. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, there's the hockey stick. So um, just sort of closing then for this evening, I just want to talk about Hevelius and the moon. You know, it's a full moon tonight, so maybe you can pop out there and, and say raise your beer to Johann Hevelius. <laughs> um, but he, uh, using his refractor, he, was, he made the first accurate atlas of the moon. Um, and he studied the moon over four years and his telescope wasn't couldn't view the entire moon so he just kind of examined a small portion of a, a time like many of us do when we're putting together mosaics that's what he did with the moon 
uh, and he very patiently recorded his observations and it was published this atlas and it was called the selenographia um, in 1647 it was published so i've just got an image of that um one of those pages there uh, so you can sort of start to see um uh um you know, sort of the beginnings of lunar topography. It was all started by Johannes Hevelius. So we have him to thank. And there's a lot you can read about this, about how it helped people with longitude. Um, it really was very helpful. And he sort of came up with the whole concept of like mountains and seas uh, as well for the moon. So um, gave a lot of people a foundation to work on, even though, you know, today when it's not entirely accurate, obviously, but uh, it really provided a helpful foundation. And... Um, What's lovely is that there's a large crater on the western edge of the oceans of st- ocean of storms on the moon that's named after him. So, uh, in so many ways, Hevelius's impact on the moon is is still visible. So, if you've got a telescope, maybe even see if you can see the crater that's uh, named after him uh, this evening uh, and his his early mentor Kruger. So to um i think we've just got one uh one left one galaxy left well that's not entirely true um let's have a look uh and this is let me see ngc 4449 uh, it's another irregular galaxy if you can see that yeah it's a little unusual um uh, but I also um, took the liberty, um, this one's only 12 million light years away actually, this galaxy, just so you know, it's quite interesting, it's um, an irregular Magellanic, oh, I never say it properly, Med- Magellanic <laughs> type galaxy, Magel- Magellanic, Magellanic, um, uh, but I uh, say took the liberty of booking up on T2 another couple that we couldn't have squeezed in tonight so but a member mentioned to me so NGC 5005 is coming up at 10 and then at 1005 NGC 4244 so if you wanted to hang out and look at some more galaxies in Canis Venatici those are there but I say there are many more that I haven't listed if you are interested in all the objects of tonight they you'll find them on the community thread for Canis Venatici um, so you can Sort of take your if there was something that really you really enjoyed you can rebook the telescopes and and go visit it um so that's kind of it for me this evening um um and it's really lovely to be back i was uh, away in portugal where i have to say the stars were just phenomenal um i was really lucky to be on a silent retreat with a teacher that i love called sri muji and um, every night when we finished satsang I got to walk back to my tent and dorm um, under under like just a canopy of stars um, and it was really lovely to think about some of the stories that we've gone through and, and think about them uh, as I sort of gazed upwards so um, it's lovely to be sort of back and then sharing these this uh with everyone in community and i really hope that we can figure out a way to interact more um uh, maybe like a sidebar of chat or something like that because i'd really love to hear what people think of these images as they see them through the telescopes with me or whether they've heard stories or have their own personal stories of um these constellations so as i mentioned um I'd like to do Boaties next. It might not be possible next week. I'll have a look. If not, maybe I'll pick something else. I normally know by Wednesdays, and then I normally put something up in the community board. Um, and I like to sort of ask you what you'd like to see in a particular constellation so I can book that uh, so we can see it together through the telescopes. Um, if there's a constellation you know is visible right now in the Canaries, um, around this time and you want to see it or even in Chile we haven't used Chile's telescope for a while um, please let me know it's helen at slew.com or you can uh, post on the community board um, I say all suggestions very much welcome and any feedback um, great too if you have stories to share um, please do so in illuminations um, <laughs> be uh, really nice to sort of have a more collaboration so 
that's it from me i'm wishing you amazing clear skies i hope where you are it's clear and that you get to go out and maybe have a look up at canis venetici and uh think of charles the <laughs> second of vicarius and his hunting dogs um and hevelius the our wonderful beer maker lunar topographer uh and the founder of this really really special constellation um which can pass us by it's so tiny but has just so many uh, wonderful objects so yeah don't forget to raise a toast or tip your hat to johannes hevelius if you're out there this evening um enjoying beltane and vesak and uh and everything that we get to enjoy <laughs> under under the night sky so that's it from me um say so you can carry on hanging out and looking at these other couple of galaxies i booked but otherwise i will see you on the community board or uh probably next sunday uh, evening but i'll keep you posted on twitter or on the community board uh, and let you know so uh, that's it from me um wish you a really lovely evening <laughs>